Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Khalil Ghanem, president of ASTDA. ASTDA is delighted yet again to recognize the achievements of our colleagues today. Uh, this today is the session where ASTDA will be presenting the 2022 ASTDA Awards. Uh, we have a full session. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to let you know what we're going to be doing uh, for the rest of the time. First, we're going to be presenting the best paper uh, published by a young investigator in the journal STD. Our second award is going to be the ASTDA Young Investigator Award. Following that, we will be handing out the ASTDA Achievement Award. And following that, for the first time, ASTDA will be handing out the Jack and Spencer Award. In the past, the Jack and Spencer Award was given out by the CDC, but this past year, the CDC has asked ASTDA to take over the management of the Jack and Spencer Award. And as a reminder, it is given out every other year uh, for a distinguished career in programmatic science. And then last but not least, we will be giving out the ASTDA Distinguished Career Award. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Bill Miller, the Editor-in-Chief of STD, who will be giving out the best paper published by a young investigator in STD. Bill? Thanks so much, Khalil. It's really an honor each year to give these awards to the best paper by a young investigator. In third place this year, we have Rebecca Ernest. Rebecca is currently a doctoral student at Yale University. Her paper is Modeling the Cost Effectiveness of Express Multi-Site Gonorrhea Screening Among Men Who Have Sex with Men in the United States. That paper was published in the no November 2021 issue of STD. In second place, we have Dr. Emily Burdett. Dr. Burdett is currently a clinical fellow in obstetrics and gynecology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Her paper was entitled Association of Delayed Treatment of Chlamydial Infection and Gonorrhea in Pregnancy and Preterm Birth. The paper was published in the December 2021 issue of STD. And finally, in first place, and the winner of our $1,000 prize is Dr. Ling Yuan Kong. Dr. Kong is currently at McGill University. Their paper was entitled, Utility of Whole Genome Sequencing in Assessing and Enhancing Partner Notification of Neisseria gonorrhea Infection. The paper was published in the October 2021 issue. Let's, uh, let's give an, a round of applause for each of these uh, award winners. It's a great honor and we're really lucky to have such great uh, early career investigators working in sexually transmitted diseases. Back to you, Khalil. The ASTDA Young Investigator Award is presented to a person engaged in outstanding work in the field of sexually transmitted diseases, who is no more than seven years from completion of training. This year, I am honored to present this award to Dr. Stacy Greiner. Dr. Greiner is currently an assistant professor in the School of Public Health at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. She completed her MPH at the University of Florida and her PhD at the University of South Florida. Dr. Greiner's work uses implementation science approaches to assess multi-level barriers to STI screening and evaluate current STI guidelines and policy implementation. Her goal through this work is to develop targeted strategies to address barriers in the prevention and treatment of STIs. She also has an interest in STI prevention, including alternative methods of screening, including direct-to-consumer testing, vaccines, and implementation of evidence-based interventions in local communities. I first met Stacy about two years ago as a doctoral student. Her passion for improving access to STI prevention and screening programs, along with her willingness to mentor others, has been an inspiration. She is always eager to join a new project and collaborate with others in the field. Overall, Stacy is the best and incredibly deserving of this award. 
Congratulations, Dr. Greiner, on this phenomenal achievement. And thank you for allowing all of us to be a part of your journey. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for honoring me with the ASTDA Young Investigator Award this year. Dr. Footman, thank you so much for taking the time to nominate me. It's truly been a pleasure working with you and getting to know you. ASTDA has supported me a great deal through professional development, and I'm thankful to be a part of an organization that prioritizes the advancement of early career scientists. I'd also like to say a big thank you to Bobby Vanderpool for bringing me into this community and being willing to take a chance on a recent graduate through a cold email. I've learned so much from you and appreciate the time and energy you've invested in my work. You're a great role model for women in science and have introduced me to leaders in the SCI field. I hope that as I advance my career, I can mentor others in the way you've mentored me. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to my incredible colleagues at the UNT Health Science Center and the School of Public Health. From the sense of community and support we've developed, I've gained confidence in my work. Academia is a very difficult path, and I'm thankful that I have wonderful people around me to keep me moving forward. I'm honored to receive this award, and I hope that I get to see all of you again in person soon so we can celebrate together. Lizzie Taroni and I are thrilled that our nominee, Dr. Kyle Bernstein, is this year's recipient of the ASTDA Achievement Award. I met Kyle 24 years ago in graduate school. He quickly became a dear friend, and I'm so happy to have been in the same professional circle for all these years to witness firsthand the impressive breadth and depth of work he's conducted to advance our understanding of STI epidemiology prevention and control. Kyle worked at a number of city health departments and then in 2014 took his local public health perspective along with his drive and creativity to work at the national level as chief of the epidemiology and statistics branch in CDC's division of STD prevention. He has a great ability to find common ground. Kyle fostered relationships across divisions at the CDC that are not typically focused on STI work, furthering collective work on meningococcal urethritis, invasive meningococcal disease, sexually transmitted shigellosis, seminal Ebola virus persistence, and the harmonization of STI and HIV surveillance activities. He strengthened the agency's relationships with the WHO, the NIH, and the FDA to address sexual health-related issues of national and international importance. Kyle is committed to strengthening the STI research community. He served on the ASTDA Board of Directors for six years and is an associate editor of the STI, STD Journal. He's deeply invested in mentoring junior scientists and fostering their professional development, and also to promoting the work of his contemporaries. He is a real talent for creating opportunities. I know that I have benefited from his championing and cheerleading countless times over the years. Many of us were a bit heartbroken when Kyle decided to transition from the Division of STD Prevention to the Division of Scientific Education and Workforce Development at CDC last year. But as Chief of the Population Health Workforce Branch, his efforts impact our STI community by helping to ensure a competent, sustainable, and diverse workforce. Kyle is fun and funny. Anyone who knows him knows the man loves some swag and loves a prop, especially a sexual health related one. His uncanny ability to insert humor in his work and his contagious enthusiasm in turn spur enthusiasm, creativity, and dedication for so many others working in our field. This award is to honor a person at mid-career to acknowledge an outstanding body of work. Congratulations, Kyle. And we look forward to your future work in helping to shape the vision of STI programs in science. I want to thank the ASTDA for honoring me this year with the Achievement Award. It's truly an honor to be recognized by your peers, and I particularly want to thank Lizzie Taroni and Preeti Pathela for nominating me. I've been fortunate throughout my career to have worked with a number of incredible mentors. Gail Bolin and Joan Chow mentored me in my early careers and I benefited from having the mentorship of Jonathan Zettelman and Emily Erbelding while doing my doctoral work. While in San Francisco, I was mentored and supported by Susan Phillip and Jeff Klausner. And then in this most recent stage of my career, I got to work once again with Gail Bolin and Charlotte Kent, 
who I knew from early parts of my career. Another person who's been very influential is Bill Miller. And one of the things that Bill always says is it's important to work with people that you have fun with. And I've been really fortunate that I've got to have fun with many of you. I also want to take a moment to thank my husband, who has always been supportive and is humors me when I have phone conversations about anal sex and vaginal discharge and no longer seems to bat an eye. It's truly an honor to be recognized today, and I thank you once again. I'm Susan Blank, former Assistant Commissioner of Health at, at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Director of the Bureau of Sexually Transmitted Infections, or STI. The Jack Spencer Award honors individuals whose careers in the prevention of STI have shown profound commitment to advancing public health via science-based programs and innovation. And so it is with pride and with great joy that I introduce to you this year's Spencer Award recipient, Dr. Julia Schillinger. Dr. Schillinger has devoted her career to improving human health first as a pediatrician, and then later as a medical epidemiologist focused in the area of sexual health. Her CDC tenure began as an epidemic intelligence service officer, and then as a staff epidemiologist at the Division of STD Prevention. Since 2002, she worked as a CDC assignee assigned to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of STI where she spent the bulk of her career directing surveillance, epidemiology, and special projects. Julie's run can only be described as a public health marathon that has resulted in improved sexual health of adolescents and adults, healthier pregnancies, and healthier infants. Her storied career is the result of deep commitment to rigorous and s systematic inquiry and practical application of findings. It has included contributions in a variety of STI subject areas, from the macro to the micro. Highlights include promoting expedited partner therapy to prevent infertility, establishing several strategies for neonatal herpes surveillance, creating opportunities for enhanced congenital syphilis prevention, and using gonococcal genomics to map sexual networks. Operationally, Julie has advanced multiple areas of STI program forward by studying every aspect of program and engaging in the full life cycle of program development from problem identification to the scoping of a problem, to conceptual design of responsive programs, to field-based proof of these concepts, to actual program development, analysis, evaluation, and dissemination of findings. She has deftly leveraged legislative and regulatory systems to advance these efforts. Dr. Schillinger has cultivated myriad important professional relationships through mutual respect. Her commitment to mentorship has enabled dozens to learn, love, and flourish in the field of STI. And her publications and presentations have gripped audiences and peers worldwide. With a perfect combination of intellect, humor, humility, and warmth, Dr. Schillinger has been an incredibly positive force in the lives of her colleagues at CDC her contemporaries across the New York City Health Department, her colleagues nationwide, and the many, many STI program staff and many mentees who admire her immensely and in whom she has instilled a real and enduring love for the field of sexual health. Julie, we all thank you for your many contributions and congratulate you on a career well spent. Thank you. Hello and virtual greetings to all of you. Thank you, Sue B, for that incredibly kind introduction. 
And thank you, ASTDA, for the tremendous honor of being selected for this year's Jack Spencer Award. I'm truly humbled to join the ranks of the past recipients and deeply moved to be recognized in this way. Receiving this award is particularly poignant for me because just a few months before Jack Spencer retired, I asked for his advice on how I might go from CDC headquarters in Atlanta to work in the New York City SDI program. The work I'm being recognized for today, I did not do it alone. I'm receiving this award because of work I did hand in hand with so many people in the field of STI. My heartfelt thanks and admiration go to the following groups. First, my CDC mentors. I retired from CDC at the end of 2021 after 28 years. For those who have not worked there, CDC has a strong and treasured culture of mentoring. I want to thank my CDC mentors, Mike St. Louis, Lori Markowitz, Stu Berman, and Tom Peterman. Your examples were powerful and inspired me to work hard to be a good mentor myself. In addition to being brilliant people, you were kind, patient, and generous with your knowledge and in giving me so many opportunities. You trusted me, believed in me, and left me alone to pursue my own path at all the right times. Next, to my dear colleagues, many of whom became friends at CDC headquarters, in the field epidemiology unit, miss you guys, and in the field of STI writ large. I wish I could be with you in person today. I loved working with you and learned so much from you over the years. In my experience, the people who work in the field of STI are uniquely friendly, accessible, and supportive. I believe this derives from the dedication and passion people in STI feel for their work and their deep commitment to advancing the field. Next, to the students, public health professionals, and medical trainees who I had the good fortune to mentor. You were talented, you worked hard, and you gave so much to the program. Your excitement and learning and appreciation for the work we were doing was an inspiring and sustaining force. I'm so proud to have known you and to have had the chance to be part of your professional development. The New York City SDI program a program and the capacity to evaluate and improve program is only as good as its people. I landed in a remarkable STI program with heroic leadership and exceptional creative and delightful colleagues who made it downright fun to come to work every day for 19 plus years. Thank you for having me, BSTI. You do outstanding work often in dire circumstances. You are amazing. And finally, a huge thank you to my husband, Dennis, and my daughter, Sylvie, and son, Sean, for their love and support. I will use the next several minutes to talk about why I was so fulfilled by practicing surveillance, epidemiology, and research in the New York City SDI program. I hope this may inspire some of you to follow a similar path. While I reference my experience in New York City, I do think many of the things I describe are intrinsic to working in an SDI program. The people. The people you work with can make or break a job. We all know that. In New York City, I literally loved many of the people I worked with. And those I didn't come to love with time, I appreciated or I came to understand. And in this way, the New York City STI program was truly a family. We laughed and cried together. We shared a passion and a purpose. The work had an immediacy that was compelling. I rode the subway knowing that if I worked hard, I could positively impact the lives of the New Yorkers around me by examining the way we delivered our sexual health services, by matching surveillance registries and triangul triangulating data sources to gain insights, and by developing and implementing policy. And it was actually possible to see the arc and impact of our work. Over the course of my career at CDC headquarters and then in New York City, I had a front row seat at a show only an epidemiologist could love. I got to take an intervention, expedited partner therapy, from research to policy to implementation. We surveilled for EPT, we evaluated it and disseminated what we learned, and finally, we engaged in more research to fill in evidence gaps that we uncovered. The work was engrossing. On any given day, I never knew what was going to happen. It might be something funny, something moving, often it was something surprising. The work was never boring, and I often had trouble tearing myself away at the end of the day, much to the chagrin of my family. 
Local public health is a data buffet. This is a phrase my husband coined. Local public health departments have more data than other public health entities higher up the chain and access to the identifiers to link across data sets. This is very powerful. Epidemiologists out there, it is possible to apply virtually every study design to routinely collect surveillance data and, of course, to electronic medical record data from sexual health clinics. Surveillance data can present challenges, but that is half the fun. And there are numerous other data sources to leverage for secondary analyses that can provide insights into the sexual health of the population. Writing. There are loads of opportunities to write and publish in STI programs. We had a wealth of data and staff and students with analytic ability, and we felt a responsibility to disseminate what we'd learned. We prioritized the writing of abstracts and manuscripts, and the period before a conference abstract deadline was always an exciting and productive time filled with new insights. Teaching. There are tons of opportunities to teach when you work in STI program. I got to teach a lot, which I loved. I loved it because I learned so much in preparing new talks, and when I spoke with different audiences, I learned a lot about how STI diagnosis and management was being practiced in the real world, which then became fodder for future grand rounds and research. Mentoring. Mentoring was one of my favorite parts of my job. The program gained so much from the staff and students who came to work with us. Sometimes we learned about emerging methodologic approaches, but mostly the students and staff brought a fresh perspective, excitement, and focus, and that was good for all of us. These pandemic years have been exhausting and challenging for everybody. And as you all know, it has been a very difficult time to work in public health. For that reason, mentoring may be more important now than ever before, as we need to provide our young colleagues with opportunities to gain experience and insight and to inspire them to step up and eventually step into our shoes to continue advancing the field of STI. Finally, I would like to end with some personal pearls of wisdom about working in STI program. Number one, find out how the sausage is made. Programs are intricate and multi-layered. They almost never function in all the ways they are expected or assumed to. Never take anything at face value. Scratch the surface and you will find something to work on. Don't accept conventional wisdom. That's a lesson from Tom Peterman. Number two, programs need to evolve, incorporating knowledge gleaned through careful study. This can be wrenching at times, but it needs to be done. Number three, get to know your health code and use it to advantage. Look for ways to improve and expand it. It should not be static. Number four, get to know the general counsel's office in your health department, not only because they may manage the health code, but also because they deal with the most interesting and challenging situations health departments face and can be incredibly helpful to you by interpreting the laws in ways that may enable your work to be more impactful. Number five, Take on students looking for analytic opportunities. Be discerning about which students you select, the projects you offer, and very clear about expectations, and it is likely everyone will be a winner. Any project we're spending time on is worth doing with rigor, not only to obtain valid results, but also to lay the groundwork for a future abstract or manuscript. So mentor students in developing table shells and sweating the details of how they approach their work, be it surveillance, evaluation, or research. Number six, get out of the office and into the field. I could have done more of this. Be the field, the clinic, spending time with DIS, delivering grand rounds, et cetera. The insights you gain will inform your work. Number seven, disseminate, disseminate, disseminate. It takes repeated and broad-based efforts to get the word out to stakeholders as diverse as healthcare providers, pharmacists, policymakers, professional organizations, and patient advocacy groups and funders, to name a few. Um, number eight, not everyone will like you, and that's okay. This is something my mother told me when I was in my early 20s, and I was aghast at the time. Now I understand what she meant. Sometimes the fact that people don't like you will be the best evidence you have that you're working on something important and asking the right questions. Number nine, Never stop advocating for the things you have data to support and believe are important, such as making neonatal herpes a nationally notifiable disease. And number 10, have fun. That's really important. And it's last but not least. Thank you again, ASTDA, for the Jack Spencer Award and for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences. And to the many colleagues and friends who are watching this, I hope our paths will cross again soon.
Hello, I'm Sharon Hillier, and I'm thrilled to be here to prevent the ASTDA Distinguished Career Award. You might ask yourself who's eligible for this amazing award, and it's really a person with a long and extraordinary career in the field of sexually transmitted diseases. So who nominated Jeannie Marazzo? It was five of us all together, Hunter Hansfield, Sev Giorel, Ned Hook, Tom Quinn, and myself. So Jeannie Marazzo is known to all of us, but she's someone who's really been in the news these past two and a half years, mainly about non-STI issues. She's certainly been in the news about COVID and we've seen her everywhere on CNN to uh, Fox to every place else. But today we're gonna really call out to the work that she's done for her whole career in STIs. So what are the big five contributions to STI research that Jeannie's made? Seminal work in sexual health for women who have sex with women, BV etiology, HIV prevention trials, which considered STIs, and always with a focus on health disparities and STIs, and especially in women's health. And finally, mentorship of the next generation of STI researchers. She really started early on doing seminal work on addressing the reproductive health needs of women who have sex with women, everything from pap smears, the vaginal microbiota, to what women who have sex with women understand about STI risk and their risk perception. She's made huge contributions to our understanding of bacterial vaginosis and was one of the first to use molecular methods and understand how the microbiome is associated with both clinical signs and symptoms of BB and then what happens when it responds to therapy. She really made an enormous contribution by leading the VOICE trial, which was one of the most important HIV prevention trials done. Basically, although the study didn't demonstrate that tenofovir gel or oral Truvada or oral tenofovir prevented HIV in young reproductive age women, what it did show us is that we needed a whole new approach to understanding social and behavioral research and understanding what drives adherence. But at the same time, Jeannie did a remarkable thing, which is using this data set to also evaluate tenofovir and its effects on HSV2 prevention, showing that it decreased in women who use tenofovir gel. She's always had an eye in diversity and research populations and as thinking about training the workforce of the future with really nice papers on sexually transmitted infections, in American Natives and Alaska Natives, as well as how we can diversify the U.S. infectious disease workforce with a special eye towards ensuring that women move ahead and that underrepresented minorities get a place at the table. This has really been demonstrated by with the teams that she's built. On the left here showing the beautiful team she worked with and uh, at the University of Harare on the voice trial and the team she's built at the ID division at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. She's also given some really standout lectures and anyone who's ever been to the retrovirus meeting known as CROI, uh, it's always really scary standing up in that room with 4,000 people and seeing yourself on that enormous jumbotron behind you. But she gave the, one of the most standout lectures ever on sexually transmitted infections for people who are really don't think enough about, eight, about this in the HIV world. So when we think about Jeannie and all that she's done, it's good to, I like to think of her also as what she is as a human being. She loves to conquer STIs, but she treasures travel time with her family and her friends seen here in, um, in a, a recent or a, a visit a few years ago in Ireland. She loves to have fun. I've ridden on Ferris wheels with her several times. She loves birds, but she's absolutely obsessed with her dogs and she often sends pictures to share of their hijinks. Jeannie loves the beach. She loves Cape May, New Jersey. She just bought a house there. And I just wanna say we love Jeannie Marazzo and thank her for her lifetime commitment to research and understanding of sexually transmitted infections. I love this photo of Jeannie because I always wonder what she's thinking about, but I know whatever it is, it will be important to all of us. Thank you, Jeannie.
Well, needless to say, it's an incredible honor to receive this award and how humbling to have one of my um, all-time uh, superstar mentors, um, Sharon Hillier, um, uh, provide the background. Um, I wanted to start by thanking my nominees who are shown here in this slide, somewhat more candid photos than uh, Dr. Hillier showed. Um, and in particular, I wanted to show them having fun. Uh, that's Tom Quinn on a sailing trip um, in the Galapagos with us and my friend Joel Gallant, who didn't nominate me, but is part of the fun. Hunter Hansfield, of course, with his uh, dear wife, Patricia McInturf, who's also a dear friend. Ned Hook, um, uh, scuba diving um, in Australia. Sevgi Oral, who it's impossible to find a candid photo of, but she looks lovely in this photo, so I include that. And then, of course, Sharon, um, shown here uh, at one of our various meetings. So I, I can't thank you enough. You all are superstars to me. I can't imagine I'm in your company. Um, that's really how I feel. And then the other people I need to thank are those shown here. Uh, my wife, Jill Hoffman, gets uh, two pictures because she has to put up with me and has been an incredibly stalwart supporter forever uh, since we've been together and even before. Um, she's shown on either side in various guises. And then to my mom who just turned 96 this year. I think those of you know uh, who know her, she's uh, in great shape, but has been an incredible role model. And then, of course, my uh, grounding canines shown at the bottom there. That's Luca and Ada. So I'm going to very quickly in 20 minutes try to run through just a few highlights. And it's not going to be as much about content as about my journey to leadership and some messages that I really want to get out there for particularly the young people um, who listen to this. I got into this field because I was really involved in the early days of the HIV pandemic, like many of us, right? And I had lots of fantastic role models, both in clinical world, in the research world, and in the public health world. And I was really interested not just in HIV, but in reproductive tract infections, particularly in women. I was also, though, very shaped by our generation's desire to engage in political and scientific advocacy and activism. And that was formed by our, our involvement with HIV and women's health as well. And so I always wanted to be kind of an agitator or an outsider with an inside track. I respected but was often frustrated by the homogeneity of leadership in academia and in medicine. And infectious disease, especially sexual health and HIV, seemed to break that mold, but with some notable exceptions. And um, that's really what led me to the University of Washington, where I spent almost all of my career starting as a fellow there in 1993 and proceeded through to become a professor and acted as division director for the ID division for a year in 2014 and 2015. And the way things really got started uh, for me in terms of, I think, the most creative stuff derived from a story that somebody told me, and it was a story of a friend of a friend who had never been sexually active with men, but who ended up having to have a cervical cancer treatment. And it struck me that no one had looked at this. And with the support really from Laura Kautsky, who was critical, as well as Hunter Hansfield, who always believed in me uh, in, in this area, um, we basically enrolled a cohort of women and showed definitively that they were sexually transmitted HPV, Denise Galloway very kindly provided the serologies, um, did them in her lab. And not only that, that they were not getting pap smears um, and that these um, behaviors, the sexual behaviors that were associated with HPV transmission were behaviors that people didn't think women engaged in. So they were penetrative behaviors. And it got back to the concept that really behind the skepticism when I would talk to people about this was the really sexist, misogynist concept that women don't have sex unless a penis is involved, which leads me to my favorite quote in Ina Park's book, where I talk about the phallocentric nature of STD research, frankly, not just ID research, but STD research. So I was delighted to uh, put that myth to rest. So that was very exciting. And at the same time, several groups, including John Zanelman, who was an early supporter too, noted a high prevalence of bacterial vaginosis in these women, despite a relatively low classic risk profile for STIs, and ultimately working with um, um, several colleagues, we found that bacterial vaginosis was highly concordant uh, within monogamous couples. Not only that, that the risk for BV in these women strongly, again, suggested links to non-hygienic vaginal practices that supported sexual transmission of vaginal flu fluid. Again, supporting that women were actually doing more than just 
cuddling. Um, and then Sharon Hillier um, and her lab with May Antonio were just terrific um, and supported me in doing this fascinating rep PCR fingerprinting, essentially proving that sexual partners had exactly the same lactobacilli phenotypes, or actually uh, PCR uh, fingerprint um, uh, profiles, which was really proof positive that what we were seeing was the sharing of the vaginal microbiome. And I think this was cool because it was sort of the first, one of the first examples of the dysbiosis that was sexually transmitted. We now know that that's probably what happens with heterosexual BV, and it can happen with urethritis as well. So that was great, um, lots of support. I would like to say that that affected some changes and in fact that informed the HPV work, informed some very influential guidelines from the CDC to, uh, to ACOG, um, but there still remain disparities. And this is a paper that I wrote an editorial about um, just relatively recently in 2015 about awareness of and pursuit of pap smear screening still being, and, and HPV vaccine, excuse me, still being um, under par um, in young sexual minority women. So I think we have a lot of work to do. We've come a really long way from when people told me this wasn't really worth studying. Um, and we can get into that over cocktail hour, perhaps in Chicago when I see you in person, but, um, but we still have a ways to go. And I think this is where I really want to go with the next 10 or so minutes. Um, I want to talk about the lessons that I learned and I want to cast them in a light that I hope is inspirational and positive. And it is that if you think something's important, it probably is. If you really care about your patients, you care about your community, and you think there's something to look at, don't let go of it. Don't be deterred by lack of enthusiasm from people who are not interested and they may not be supportive for several reasons. Sometimes they're not as smart as you are, um, frankly, and especially in the area that you're talking about, sometimes they're threatened by you or they're threatened by the content because it may seem weird to them. I can tell you that a lot of the work that we thought about in the 90s um, related in particular to trans health. Um, was uh, really not supported until the sea change in our thinking about that uh, relatively recently. Some people are really risk averse and they may not want to pursue scientific hypotheses that are outside of their purview. Um, I also think that um, support sometimes cause, comes from surprising quarters. I'll never forget Stan Spinola pulling me aside at the Principles of STD HIV Research course after the vaginal microbiome paper came out in, uh, in, in JID on the lesbian couples. And he said, you know, that work you're doing in lesbian couples is really interesting. And I just about fainted because if you don't know Stan, he's, he's phenotypically um, a very white uh, male Midwestern guy who does basic science Shankar research. And that like was so important to me. Uh, I will really never forget that because he really, really gave me a validation that I need. And then finally, if you do good science, it always wins. It's like love always wins. Good science always wins. So I think the lessons learned are that you have to know your roots and you have to embrace your passions and really be a warrior about it. Care about what you do. Figure out how to do it well, whereas, where that's where the good science comes in. And then I want to pivot a little bit because, as I alluded to, not all of us got consistent con encouragement. And I think as you're thinking about your career, it's really important to think about how do you end up in the right room with the right people at the right time? I wouldn't have gotten some of that work done without the generosity and mentorship of people like Laura Kautsky, Sharon Hillier, many others. Um, and can you break out of the conventional box of thinking and maintain your credibility and advance and build your own vision of a team? And how do you persuade the people who have power that your work matters, especially given the slide I showed previously? And I think it's important to acknowledge that the box, right, you know, when you're in the box and everybody's in the box and you're supposed to think outside the box, the box can be very comfortable. Um, it's a nice, cozy place where you don't necessarily have to be challenged. Um, unfortunately, the box makes it very easy for the people who need to change to avoid it. And by that, I mean people who won't, don't listen to your ideas or won't really um, take a chance on you because maybe what you're talking about isn't something they've thought of or not in their, their realm. And I think many of us who've done this work uh, sort of have sometimes felt like we were on a different wavelength or network entirely. We're talking about things, sexual behaviors, we're talking about this, that, and the other thing. And um, that 
sometimes doesn't resonate with the people who really run the world. Um, I do want to ask whether this happens more frequently in women, and I have no doubt that it does. I would strongly recommend this excellent um, um, uh, edition of Harvard Business Review. They have, and they've updated these uh, papers as well, talking about the barriers, particularly for women in leadership in medicine and medical research. And I think this will not be a surprise to you, but there are a couple of things that I think are good takeaways. Clearly, we all deal with implicit gender and maternal biases. There are system-wide policies largely around family um, care that disadvantage women, but not limited to that. Certainly, we've all experienced sexual harassment and predatory behavior, I'm sorry to say, and sometimes worse. And I think the biggest thing that we need to change and we're only making strides into is the lack of sponsorship. Again, not going into detail, but I want to just point this out. This is not always overt sexism or gender biases. It's really something that people are talking about as a second generation thing. So there aren't enough role models. Career paths and work remain very gendered. Um, there are really challenges to double working couples for the woman. And then I want to talk very briefly about sponsorship. So we all know lots of great mentors. We pay tribute to them. They're fantastic. But a sponsor is not a mentor and you need sponsors as much as you need mentors. Mentors are often contact experts. They can help you open doors. But sponsor is somebody who has power and is willing to use it for you. And advancing really means getting to prove yourself in high profile positions or assignments. And those are positions that sometimes you have to be invited into, right? You don't have a key. Um, it turns out that women are often over mentored and under sponsored for a lot of reasons that you can figure out. Um, and not all mentors have equal power. So I would really strongly encourage you to think about this as you create your teams of people who are supporting you as you move forward. So how do you deal with all of these challenges, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're non-binary, whatever. Um, I think I'm just going to tell you real quickly about my approach and where it's taken me. So I think it's really important to counter pessimism, skepticism, laziness, and resistance to change, which I think is rampant. And frankly, after the pandemic, um, I would include a lot of burnout there with professional activism informed by passion, commitment, and evidence. Um, you can be passionate, but if you don't have the evidence to back you up, you're never going to really affect change. And you need to figure out how you can maximize your impact by exerting the power of influence through leadership. And sometimes this requires bold moves. My most recent bold move, as shown here, was to move to Alabama. Um, and when I think about moving to Alabama, it's a whole other talk. Um, but I love this quote, um, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Um, so why did I move uh, to Alabama? Well, um, really three reasons. One is because I wanted to have an impact. And um, certainly I felt like I was doing that in Seattle and Sharon graciously summarized some of the things I've done. But there is just a huge amount of work to do here, as I know this uh, group knows. I also felt it was really important to experience an environment that was committed to diversity and had diversity in leadership. And then finally, um, Dr. Selwyn Vickers, who was the dean until just the first of this month, when sadly we lost him to become president at Sloan Kettering, uh, was an incredible draw. He was he's a visionary leader, uh, just just really understood what change and social justice mean in the context of healthcare and medicine. So very important. So I think the lessons derived from this and my decision to move are: it's important to know who your boss is and who your boss is boss is. Are their values aligned with yours? Do they have a shared purpose for cultivating the culture you want to work and live in? And it also takes resources, and that means money and human capital to build and cultivate a diverse team and a team that you want. And to diversify means to recruit, right? You've got to have the resources to recruit and convey your vision to get people to come work with you. Other things, I think it's really important to continuously reinforce expectations and course correct. Always ask for feedback. Don't get defensive. And really important, and I think we forget this, especially as we get more successful, solicit input from people who you think might not agree with you. 
getting into um, the echo chamber is really the rule as you rise up the ranks, right? Because less people are going to disagree with you and tell you they think you're not doing it right. And it's really, really important. And then most importantly, you know, stay engaged. And we need this in the sexual health field now more than ever. Be there, go there, get embedded and resist what Sevki and others have called the sort of mixing, which is hanging out with people who look like you, working with people who look like, like you, being in communities where you feel really comfortable. Um, and even if you don't agree with people, certainly moving to this environment um, politically has reinforced this to me. We can all have a shared purpose, agree to agree on aiming for a mutually desirable outcome, stay optimistic and recognize that we all have biases. So um, I think optimism and trust in change and that we can make really good change is the point about the glass being refillable. And then finally, I just want to convey um, sort of how I put this together for building uh, teams in my group. You really have to start with vision, and that takes a leadership to enact that vision. And what you want to do is to create and build community around your research, your clinical and educational priorities, recruit, train, and invest in the next generation of faculty, but also staff. And then think about how you're going to put it all together after you analyze it to create implementation opportunities. And for us, it's sexual health care, but this can hold for whatever you want to do. So I'll finish up. I think this is my last slide. Um, just remember, sometimes you forget how much influence you have. Your words matter, your passions matter. Um, you should articulate some really audacious goals. They call them stretch goals, whatever you want to call them, but be specific about them and don't be afraid to say, I want to show this. I want to do this. I want to go here. Um, that said, a relentless focus on the top of the ladder is not always the best approach. We've always uh, seen people above us kicking us down. We don't like that because we really need to bring everyone up. Uh, to create a successful culture at work. And with that, um, I will thank you from the bottom of my heart. There are, I could spend two days thanking the people more specifically, of course, who gotten me to this point. I've only mentioned a few. Um, Ina Park is one of them. Um, but thank you. And I can't wait to celebrate you all in person. Congratulations to all our award winners. Please remember to nominate your colleagues in February for next year's awards. And next year's awards are going to be taking place in person at ISSTDR in Chicago in July. Remember to renew your membership in December and encourage all the young investigators that you know to join ASTDA. For the young investigators, it's only $25 a year. And all ASTDA members next year will receive a $150 discount for signing up to ISSTDR in July, their registration fees. So also remember that for young investigators, they have access to small project assistance grants, through the ASTDA, as well as ASTDA Summer Fellowship. So please renew your membership, encourage young investigators to join, and we will see you live and in person in July in Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of the conference.